Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the Rugby Paper Podcast. Plenty on the menu today is joining us to take trips down memory lane, discuss the Champions Cup, Northampton, England and the British Lions, is England World Cup winner and rugby legend Matt Dawson. We'll get going then. Welcome back to the Rugby Paper Podcast. Um, feels like it's been a while and we've had a little 10 day gap. Um, in that time, the knockout stages of the Champions Cup have crystallised and are now well and truly set. It's quarterfinal weekend coming up. We'll preview that alongside talking a little bit about England and the British Lions. Um, and joining myself and the columnist today, a few days after his beloved Northampton secured their quarterfinal spot, is World Cup winning scrum half and England legend Matt Dawson. Did you enjoy the weekend, Matt? Um, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, I shot seventy nine, so I'll, uh, <laughs> chuffed to <a> bits. <laughs> well, where were you playing? Uh, I'm uh, I'm very fortunate to be a member at Sonningdale, so oh, a good lovely. score. Not yeah. bad. Tough course as well. So seventy nine is a good score. It it is well, it'd be a past seventy. So, uh, uh, but it is tough. Yeah, but I'll yeah. take nine. Not, not I didn't. Bad. I didn't know there was a crazy golf course at Sunningdale. Oh, <laughs> see, there you've just ruined your invite. <laughs> you know, just seriously. as well, Matt. I tell you, <laughs> I have no idea. I know his idea of a golfer. Believe me, Chewy. That's not not just your golf invite. That's your invite to this podcast as well. Oh, I see. Excellent. Well, nice to see you all. <laughs> so, well, I suppose we just had a little insight into it, but Matt. Talk about your life at the moment. From the outset, it seems very chaotic, but in a very good way. That's it. Oh, all right. Okay. I'm, I'm interested to know what the outset. Sorry. Um, well, from the or, outside. Or the, from the outside, how that how that looks. Um, yeah, not I mean, not not uh, not so much in rugby, other than um, I do a little bit of work. Um, around sort of sort of behind the scenes stuff in some administrative roles which is sort of consultative which is great keeps keeps my uh keeps my hand in a little bit but um mostly mostly working in town real job tim rodbert is still one of my bosses um uh, and uh, and spending time with the family playing golf and yeah trying to keep the walls from the door as as ex pros are all trying to do how long have you given you you given yourself to have a, a healthier current account than Tim Robert, Matt? Uh, I'm not sure that'll ever happen. <laughs> um, as as he's my boss, it's not supposed to happen, is it, Chris? But um, I, I've enjoyed it. I've I've really really enjoyed it. I mean, you guys will remember Rodders for being a very confrontational, organised military. Um, you know, no hold, no hold bars, holds bar individual. Um, and, and, and he hasn't really changed too much, but he's just, he's worked out how to temper it in the corporate world to be a, he's a significant operator. He really does know how to, you know, bring people together, teams together, innovation, creativity. I mean, we're in a, we're in a work a, a property a property world in a workspace world where it's uh, it's very very uh, confrontational dog eat dog, and uh, it's not just all it's not all about the presence of the individual that he brings. It's the uh, the knowledge and the um, the 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 manner and character of Tim has not changed. So he does get things done really well. I remember going to the opening of his offices <clears throat> on Richmond Green, was it, about 1994? Yeah. And I thought then, this is either, he's either going to be a billionaire, mega success, or this will be closed down in six months. And it <laughs> was, obviously it was the former, you know, because he's got some real good strident qualities, doesn't he, Tim? And, it, you know, you could, you could see how he, re he was really into it. I thought, is he messing around with this or is this just a sort of he's fallen into it? But no, he had a plan from the word go. Yeah, and it, he it was always like that, wasn't it? As a as a player, and maybe to his detriment, you know, he retired in in two thousand, and probably could have played. I don't know whether he, he yeah, you know, maybe he could have been in contention for the World Cup in oh three, um, but had a bit of a, <clears throat> a, a a roller coaster relationship with Clive, 
um, got his teeth stuck into corporate world and then was, no, no, I, I could really make this work. And he's never looked back since. You know, he, he yeah. is absolutely dedicated day in, day out. You know, he's built, he's built a business from, uh, I mean, it's got to be 10 plus years that we've been there. And it started at about 60 people. And now it's at 600 people, you know, turnover from, I think it was, I don't know, 16 million quid to selling the business last two years ago for, you know, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, of course, he's never going to say it's all him, but it, I, I think it's that in, uh, particularly in that space that we're in his, uh, absolute dedication to success i mean we forget he was you guys won't forget but he was way ahead of his time he was he was with you know, going up against dean richards he wasn't the old school type of player was he He was that no. very more more a modern day back row opposed to a teague or winterbottom or robinson or you know dean richards mm. um him and ben clark were he, 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 very what much different do? types of back rows yeah. um so he's always he's always sort of been pushing himself a little bit and i i quite like it guys to be honest. i quite like still being in that environment uh because you, you have that you sort of have, still have that rugby team relationship where you know there's a look to one another as you know often he will look at me and say you know it doesn't need to say anything, but a look to say, pull your finger out. You, you, you know, you need to change what you're doing here. As well as he'll call me up and say some great things. And, you know, we we really need you to do X, Y, and Z and keep that going. And it's, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's a really nice relationship that I've, I've, I've sort of cherished and been very fortunate to keep on uh, working with him. A couple of cameos that stick in my mind about Tim are, one where he picked Cobus Visser up off the ground, tipped him upside down and dropped him on his head. <laughs> Fair tackle. I that think, was permitted in those days. No, no, no. He, he, <laughs> in in this, I think it was the first test against South Africa. I think in 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 could have been 90, 92 or ninety four. I'm not quite sure. Ninety four maybe. And the 94. other, yeah. yeah, and the other was when. Uh, you were playing Eastern Province, and <laughs> he was Tim was tipped as the as the future England captain <laughs> until I think it was Kel Tremaine's son, who was uh, Kiwi playing for Eastern Province, decided to slot him, and um, it all went <laughs> completely belly up when Tim um, lost his military composure. <laughs> <laughs> he won the fight. He won the fight, though. Oh, he certainly did. He did. I, I remember Let, John John Callard, who was playing. That was a very rough game. I mean, that was a horrible yeah. game. Yeah. I, I only watched it's it on TV. Game. But I was doing something with John Callard. I was back on the Bristol Evening Post in those days, and John was reasonably local to us. I was doing some stuff, and he said, "Well, that was very funny with Rob Burr because he actually came off the bench and said to the referee, Christ, what have you got to do to get sent off around here?'" About <laughs> twenty minutes later, we found out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Eleven shots he got away. <laughs> eleven, he got eleven hammer blows away in, I don't know, four seconds or something. It was pretty it was impressive. impressive. Yeah. So, so they know they know just how far to push him in the boardroom. I suspect. Well, I, I think it's quite a nice calling card, though, Nick, isn't it? I mean, you, nowadays with all this technology, if you just walk into a room and say with your introduction, maybe you just have a little five second clip of you pummeling the shit out of something. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Matt, just well I mean, he, hasn't, he hasn't changed his shape as well, by the way. If you saw him Is he still like, ripped? Bloody hell. It, I mean he's still an absolute man mounted but ripped. You know, looks so strong. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it, it, I mean, I mean, we're we're all like that, Matt. I think you'll find it. And, um... <laughs> yeah, well, you are, you are, Chris. Yeah. He was immense uh, on that '97 tour. That that Lions. Oh, tour. that that first yeah. test, he absolutely hammered him, didn't he? The first twenty yeah. minutes that set the tone a bit. 
It's not often you see the Springboks gun shy, but um, when when he came into view, they uh, they were shipping the ball on pretty quickly. Let's put it that way. <laughs> that, that's what makes him. That's what makes him relevant to today's game, as Matt was saying earlier. That is, it, I mean, the game has moved towards what Tim was doing. Mm. It hasn't. It hasn't moved away. He'd be. He'd be a. He'd be a big, big hit now in. Um, oh, in, God. imagine in, him in, playing. In, oh my God! He in all senses of the word, it. he'd be a big hit yeah. now, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. It's slotting, no problem. Matt, just while we're taking a trip down memory lane, and the first thing you said when you logged on to the Zoom call was that it, it's like twenty years ago all over again. And I just want to ask if you have any memories with our. <laughs> Wonderful, of encounters with our wonderful columnists um, that you'd be willing or able to share with us? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the, the first thing that springs to mind, other than Brendan, who Brendan and I worked together for a, probably a few years, didn't we, doing the column? Yeah, four years doing the column, yeah. Um, but to be honest, most of the time I would, I would spend trying to avoid them, as they well know. <laughs> um, I... I you know, I I I wasn't uh, I wasn't a uh, I wouldn't say I was a go to player for these guys because I was a moody little prick who, you know, got you know I was a chippy individual who, when and particularly with the media, there was you know media was very different. It was very different types of writing. Um, you know, a, a different medium. It wasn't particularly um as interactive as maybe it is now obviously with social media and podcasts and the like um and i i, I took a lot of offense to <clears throat> the personal nature of a lot of the writing back back then and rather than only by certain individuals and so i i decided you know what i was a bit like no if 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 certain individuals are going to write that then i'm done um, mm -hmm. which was, you know, it, it was a, it was a, a, an immature thing to do, but you know, you're, you're in the bubble of playing international rugby and, you know, you're going to have some regrets in, in your life and I had to sort of just put up with that. But you also had an ideal foil, didn't you, Matt, in uh, Austin Healy, who was prepared to jump into the limelight at any, any possible opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he he yeah uh, he wasn't scared of it, was he? He wasn't uh, he he wasn't worried about um yeah anything that he was doing. He was uh, he was going to create some kind of entertainment for the players, the management, the media, um, and he he was very very good fun to hang around with. I mean, and not that he is obviously on this call, but um, in that O one. Where I was doing, I think I was doing it with Mick, wasn't it? Was Mick was on the tour, wasn't he? So he did. Yeah, the I think, I, think yeah. I was doing a column with with Mick then, and um, I wrote. I I was doing a diary, and uh, the Telegraph did a, a headline, basically saying that the coach doesn't inspire me, which is not what I said, but obviously that is the that's the headline. You've got to go with it, and. Um, I've just done my. I've just done my. Um, uh, my sent my column, column in, and Austin has walked back into the room. I'm sharing the room with him, and he he's walked back from the press conference, which I didn't go to, and um, he just looked at me and went, "You are in so much trouble." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "What are you talking about?" <clears throat> He said, have you not heard from home? I'm like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, oh, your column has absolutely ripped it apart. You And this is before the game. This is the morning of the game or something like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, as it pans out, Donald Lenahan went absolutely bonkers because I'd written some truths about the tour um, in the diary or had insinuated things into the diary. Uh and uh, yeah, needless to say, I, I was on the bench, but needless to say, I didn't get on. Uh, <laughs> and then I got fined. What 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 really peed me off about that is, uh, you know, you guys you guys know what we used to get paid, and it yeah, it wasn't a lot of money, was it? But 
at the, at the time it was a few hundred quid or whatever it was and I Donald Lennon pulled me aside on the Monday after I'd apologised to the squad, the boys were ripping into me and laughing. I had to sit in front of the whole squad and apologise. <laughs> you know, we'd won the game, and but you know it was out of order to break ranks. Even though all the players were they walked out of the meeting, were like, "Dorsey, you, you're so right." I mean, that's exactly how we feel. All that sort of stuff. But you yeah, know, yeah. got to training on the Monday, and Donald Lennon pulled me aside and said, um, "We we've met. Management have met." And uh, we're not going to send you home. And the, I was like, well, all right, thanks. He said, but we're going to fine you. I was like, okay. He goes, I think it's only fair that we should fine you what you got paid for the for the uh, column. I was like, okay, fair enough. Whatever, let's move on. Five grand I got fined for that. You didn't, you didn't get five grand for the column. Five grand. And it, that was a third, I think that was a third of the fee of the tour. Yeah. For that one column from Donald Lenahan. Leaders say I never spoke to him again. I've got to tell you, by the way, Dawes, so I um I, I added it up. I think I think I did about 90 different sports when I've ghosted the columns. And um just blowing a bit of smoke up your ass. You were by far the most um punctual. You were always on the end of the phone when you said you were gonna be there. Uh, except one occasion. 2003 summer tour you'd done Maori's New Zealand Australia and you all went on the piss in Perth on the way yeah. back Do you remember you were checking out the facilities yes for the World yeah. Cup and yeah. I, I, I was chasing you down for about two days and eventually I got you by the pool I think on the mobile but you were absolutely hammered so you sort of <laughs> grunted a bit and we put a thousand words of grunts together and we got this column we had the best ever <laughs> ever feedback on the column you, you were sort of painting the picture of the good life sitting by the swimming pool end of season beating the Aussies beating the Kiwis World Cup here we come and uh, it got a really good Sorry, response who was, paint, who was painting that picture Brendan? well exactly was uh, I was you? painting it from a few grunts and laughs, <laughs> yeah and I, 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 I mean I'd love I'd love to claim that I remember those amazing words that, that <laughs> column but well, it, 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 at least you had it sort of the right way round because when Ed, the late Eddie Butler did his, his equally famous 2001 column with Austin Healy, one of them had been drinking as well, and it wasn't Austin. No, no, that, and that was a good, that was a great column that as well. Oh, it was a belting oh, column. God, it was really, really good, wasn't it? All, all the, the best one, poetry is written when you're as high as a kite. All the best poetry comes <laughs> when you've been on something. <laughs> Matt, you mentioned how you weren't particularly compatible with the way the media operated um, back during your playing career. And obviously now doing what you do, you can kind of pick and choose, I suppose, um, your your media battles, so to call them. But And players have the power to do that more a little bit as well. Do you think you'd be more more at home with it and more comfortable with, with the sort of system now if you were a player? Um, I, would I would like to think that I'd... You know, nowadays that they have the players have a a better education as to how they can converse and potentially leverage the media better. I mean, yeah. Back back you know, back when I was doing it, I, I, I say I was in so many ways I was really really immature and just in my thinking and and it didn't. You know, like someone like let's use Lawrence, great example of just was like right, I can manipulate them and I the Clive, I can manipulate the media here. And it doesn't take much, I uh, you know whether it's being available at the right time, at, 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 you know for for comments, whether it's taking them out for a a beer or a bite to eat or just being there and saying the right thing. You know, there were lots of ways where it would just, it was very obvious who the media liked that then opposed to didn't have a relationship with. The media didn't dislike people, but they would have, you know, a fair few favourites that they know that they could go to. You know, and, and let's... Yeah, you know, whether it's the same now, I doubt it. But there were also some amazing moles um, that were, you know, feeding this lot. 
incredible stories. Um, and so for some, not, uh, not certainly not me, I didn't have that, that sort of foresight. I, I took it, as I said to you before, I took it all too personally. I just saw it as black and white print. Why are you saying that about me? Right, you're off the list. Right, you know, it was just all, all a bit, you know, I just didn't get it. I really, I really, really didn't get it. Um, whereas nowadays, I would like to think that with a bit of education from either the clubs or uh, more senior players um, and the relationships that you can build with uh, the media, whether it would be, you know, written online, TV, radio, et cetera, um, you, you know, it, you can... I, I think you can sort of maximise each other's exposure so much better. I mean, a lot of the, um, a, a, a lot of the either writers or general journalists now are expanding their sort of their breadth of, um, uh, I say, dare I say, celebrity, yeah. because they're they're understanding how that they can help the players and how the players can help them. Um, and it wasn't necessarily as easy to do back then. It was these guys had a had a column to write, had a job to do. Um, now and again, they might get a, a a chance to write a book with one of the players when they're retiring. But I, you know, I, I can't imagine it was anywhere near as uh, as uh, opportunistic as maybe it is now. So did you feel you had that Twitter on the '97 Lions trip? That would have been an event. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> that was a now, narrow miss. Well, on, on, on on that tour, though, Matt. I mean, we, a lot of us have a lot of you know we're we're of a certain age. Um, um, I mean, us three, not like you two young guns. Um, but we look back on that '97 tour. Pretty much is the last of the the first of the professional tours and the last of the amateur tours. If you see what I mean, the, the it, it was actually quite convivial and inclusive in the relationships between the press and the players. Yes, there was some. There, there were always going to be players who just didn't like the media spotlight. They didn't really want to sit down and be interrogated or ask a load of daft questions. Um, but there, there, it was. We did sort of be. We were in the same hotels and we were having a few beers together and all that kind of thing. It, it was the most relaxed tour I ever went on. To be honest, that that was that was a really. It's a golden memory that tour. Yeah, yeah. There's a re- what we're talking about at the moment. G- g- One of the g- reasons the management must have been a, a large part to do with that, guys. Surely, yeah. Geech, Geech was Geech was brilliant. Telford was brilliant. Jim Robson was brilliant. Fran was brilliant. Fran, Fran was brilliant. Tony yeah. Was very yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, Frank got it. Yeah, it was, also, it was excellent. And there were also Chewy. just a bunch of massive drinkers in the squad. Yeah. Also, Chewy, it was a winning tour, and that makes it that makes a hell of a difference too. Um, yeah. But yeah. interesting, Matt, because I, I sort of think that, I mean, there are a lot of the um, you know you know the rugby journalists now. I, I think that their access to players. Funnily enough, is in many ways it's a real bone of contention. Um, it's been pretty poor um, during this sort of social media age, if you like, and there's been a lot of firewalling of players, perhaps more than there ever was. And um, I'm not sure that rugby union yet has got its head around the fact that in a um, a very competitive sporting world. Actually, your accessibility is, and the leverage that you talk about, is absolutely critical to the promotion of the sport. And I think that a lot of players still haven't got their heads around that. So it's a really good point, Nick. It's a really good point. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's there's probably similarities in the there are some players out there that get it and will do the extra mile and do stuff away from the club and will um, maybe them and their agents will be clever about it. Yeah. Um, but the, certainly the, the, um, the, the contrast to the Lions conversation of, you know, Fran and Geet and Jim, um, 
exit. And who was who was our me? Who was what was the name of the the media? Bob Burrows. Bob. Bob Burrows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the ITV guy. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah com compare where they're sort of embracing it and saying, "Listen, we need we need this educators." I mean, we had uh, what's his name from the the who was who was the. Uh, God, my memory's so bad, isn't it? The, uh, one of one of your pals from the Sun or the Mirror. Oh, came. that was David Norrie. Norrie. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, yeah. Rest the squad yeah. about you know stings and all the rest of it, and gave us a full briefing on what to look out for before we even get to South Africa. Um, you know, so the the coaches and the management were were absolutely on board and wanted to help us, whereas. Now, as as sort of you you refer you you allude to there, Nick, the it's the coaches that are saying, no, yeah, don't, don't don't go on this. I don't want doing that. I mean, even to the point where I I've and other ex pros have been banned from going to training with sort of corporate sponsors and right. because as if we're going to dish the dirt or i mean it's bonkers it's utterly bonkers but that and that's being stopped by the coaches uh, uh, and we, we we do have to be we do have to be a little bit careful uh, that if, if we all know how much the game is struggling um uh, the game needs to uh, i mean it, it's not even I, I i can't believe it will be in the top 10 sports in the world for um popularity yeah you know, you'll have there'll be cricket um basketball football volleyball will be in the top mm -hmm. five um tennis, golf. well tennis certainly golf maybe yeah. not as much Go golf is miles down mm -hmm. uh, and so and so is rugby um so you know we if we if we're going to take this game forward we've got to have uh, as you mentioned it that the the communications behind it and rather than you know I, i've spoken to um i'm having a conversation with you know sort of one of your one of your colleagues about the the sort of disgruntled relationship that some of the journalists have with a lot of the clubs because they just can't get either they can't get access or the clubs have not really got a comms you know a quality comms team to deal with it and they're being blocked by the coaches i mean yes. it's, it, it it's if you if you, go from, one extreme, you go from one extreme to the other don't you where you're like what, what you've got rugby who really should be pushing to market and um tell the world about how great sport it is we're sort sometimes we're shooting ourselves in the foot and strangling ourselves with all the negativity around rugby but we're also not prepared to give mm. new people access or even existing fans access to the sport as you look at formula one where you will all know as i will all uh, uh, constantly meet whenever someone mentions formula one nowadays the per i mean it's my other half the other day oh can we watch drive to survive i'm like what so like, oh yeah, I don't really like Formula One, but Drive to Survive was amazing. I, I saw the first two episodes on Netflix. I want to watch it. And they've got access, as so much access to the players, whereas, um, you know, we're we're still behind the eight ball, really. So we I can show you how much it's changed, Matt. Before that '97 Lions trip, which was my first Lions trip, Barry Newcomb, the late Barry Newcomb wrote out a little 10-point memo to me about what to do on Lions trips as a journo. And number one was always attend the training in the morning because he said the manager, the coach, and the players will notice if you don't. You know, if you're off late night or got other things, sightseeing, having a lay-in, it will be noticed. You were so expected to be at every training session. It was almost like you'd be fine if you weren't at the training session. Really? And now you, you can't get in for love and money. No. Do you no. remember Graham Henry before the um, before the last test in two thousand and one, last Lions test? Uh, he fallen out big time with the with the with the press. He wasn't a very happy man, and the eve of test, uh, 
what would now be called the captain's run, he barred the press from it completely. And no one held it at Manly Oval, which is a public space. So along with the thousand, along with the thousand people from Manly who turned up to see the Lions practice their line outs, were the entire press corps who he couldn't actually stop from entering. <laughs> it was it was just that that was that was it's just an example of how the coaches overthink stuff and react very ne negatively when they feel that the press is getting on their back a little bit or if there's some danger from the press and they make a dumb call like that it just made him look ridiculous and he's a bright bloke that that was the same that was the same session chris the same scenario where we caught one of the people watching training um with their coat like this and they had a video camera yeah, you know, and bearing in mind this is 97 it wasn't a small thing and it was like sort of so strapped around his chest but he was holding there just videoing all the line outs so what did you say to Eddie Matt <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was just madness after madness <laughs> Just while we're semi on the subject of lines, because I don't want to get through an entire episode without talking about anything on my list. Um, Matt, I want to run our British and Irish Lions 15 by you. We put it together the week after the Six Nations. Don't feel obliged to give us yours. If you have it locked and loaded, by all means do. But um, I'll go through ours slowly and you can unpick it if you want to, if, that, if that's okay with you. Go on there. Uh, we've got an all Irish front row, um, Andrew Porter, Dan Shee and Tyke Furlong. Uh, yeah, OK. If there's nothing screaming out, I'll move on. Maru Itoje and Joe McCarthy in the row. Yeah, yeah I mean, weirdly, the, 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 the one that I would maybe question would be Maru Itoje. Which we did uh, well, to be fair, just because in, in a Lions shirt, he has always been a bit yeah. of a... So we're hoping that he would bring the best out of himself. Um, Ty Byrne... But I Kiff. would... If I was going to, I would... If you were going to replace him, yeah, I, I think someone like this uh, George Martin yeah, is going to be a Lion. I just think he's got that... Like, like the McCarthy, he's got something about him something really horrible about him yeah. that other teams are going to not want to come up against I think we we maybe said that if it was South Africa I think a Martin McCarthy second row yeah, true. is really hard hitting um, but for that reason we've gone a second row at six in Tyburn Ben Earl and Caelan Doris um, as a back row decent Jameson um, sorry, um, uh, sorry who, who's at seven Earl Earls at seven, Doris at eight, which we toed and froed about. But yeah, um, to fit them both in, we did that. Doris is our captain. Jameson Gibson Park at nine, which I think is almost impossible to disagree with at this point. Finn Russell at 10. Bundy Aki and Ollie Lawrence in the midfields. James Lowe, Duhan van der Merwe, Hugo Keenan as the back three. If there's anything screaming out to you, then... What's the what do you say the back three was there? Keen and Vandermeer and James Lowe. Yeah. The only other name we were semi discussing was actually Emmanuel Bay well, Waboso. I think it's probably it's probably a bit early for him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who who knows that another Six Nations, uh, some autumn internationals, but with that the quality that you've just mentioned there at that level, bloody hell. Yeah. Uh, when, when you got turfed in the like, 97 Lions series, Matt, I mean, you weren't the oldest yourself. I mean, you've been around a bit longer than he had, but how did, how, w was there a tangible difference in how you regarded the responsibility of the shirt when you, when, when you were given a Lions, when you were given a Lions starting place? I mean, that's a, that's a good old step, isn't it? For a young, youngish player. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've got you've got to put the context in of how it all came about, though. I mean, we I know were, Rob, Rob Howley was injured, wasn't he? And yeah, and the the battle was about the bench. Yeah, you and know, Austin I, was the I, only I, other I, choice, so you were bound to win that. I mean, I was always going to win that, wasn't I? <laughs> well, um, he, I, I try to tell you what, Matt. He tried to head it off. He came into the press conference <laughs> just before the team was announced. 
and regaled us all and said, you know, they're talking about Matt, Matt Dawson. They can't pick him. It's got to be me. Oh, <laughs> you about it. <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 we all knew from the off from Weybridge that it was going to be Rob and Gregor. Everybody knew it. Um, so it, you know, we had, I don't know, seven weeks of basically who's going to get on the bench. Um, and I, I, I was well aware that Austin, uh, I mean, Paul Grayson spoke to me a lot about this whilst he was on the, on the trip, uh, before he went home on, you know, I had to, I had to bring something else other than scrum half because Austin was always going to be able to cover lots of positions. It, it, it didn't, in effect, it didn't really matter who was playing well enough at scrum half. It was, well, what are you going to cover? Hmm. So Gray and Grace knew that I kicked goals and had spoken to Dave Allred to say, you should get Matt into the kicking group because he'll be an option. And that's really where I started my sort of international kicking duties and reputation for being a backup kicker was on the 97 Lions tour. Um, and and really, uh, yeah, I, I suppose from the games that we had, there, there wasn't an awful lot in it. Um, it was purely down to you know what combination did they want to have on the bench and to to complement what they were doing on the field in the back line regarding the kicking. So you uh, had two goal, you had two goal kickers and the Springboks had none. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if you you know that that combination of you know, Gregor wasn't a very good goal kicker. Um, they picked obviously picked Jenks at fifteen because he was a goal kicker. Yeah, they didn't really have a lot of goal kickers. Stimo was kicking, but was never going to be in the squad because of the other players that were around. So they absolutely needed another goal kicker. And then, as it pans out, I end up being on the bench for the Natal game when Rob gets injured. Then I played my best yeah. half of rugby you know, a week before the test match with all the other test match players for Geach to, to say, and obviously Geach had seen me at Northampton, but then all of a sudden Jim and Jono are watching me at that level and thinking, actually, he's slotted in really well. Yeah, and then and then the try in the first test put, um, you know, put you on a, uh, on an absolute uh, upward trajectory, didn't it? Austin couldn't get at you after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that would have been. A, I think that would have been a brave call to to drop uh, to drop me after that game. Um, yeah. Gary Teichman's still looking for you, by the way. Yeah, send his yeah. regards. Bless him. Him and the five others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 best the, the best moment of that trip, uh, rugby wise. Um, most memorable rather than best probably one of my most memorable moments would have been in the third test when um, Austin Healy came on and was told by Geach and Jim to come on for Jenks at fullback and Austin Healy went up to the fourth official and said right okay they want me to go on. And the fourth official said, who are you going on for? And he said, Matt Dawson, number <laughs> nine. And he did not give a shit about <laughs> what the coaches said. Uh, they, dra <laughs> they dragged me off in the third test of the Lions. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so good. Oh, Amazing. brilliant. I mean, could you even begin? I mean, obviously it couldn't happen now, but the audacity of him is just yeah. remarkable. Unbelievable. I mean, how how, how many minutes? How, how long was there remaining? Uh probably. Yeah, probably. I bet there was twenty minutes. Ago. Yeah. It must have been. Yeah, it must have. Been. I mean, I did wonder because I 
I was playing really well, scored a try, was <laughs> organising. You know, we were on the sort of comeback a little bit because we were behind. And then it was like, all right, okay. Fair, you know, fair <laughs> <right>. <laughs> oh, that's, so that's fantastic. So good. <laughs> Matt, just, I'm I'm conscious that we we don't keep you too long, but I do want to talk about England a little bit. Um, and obviously the Six Nations were a few weeks ago now, so we won't talk about it too in depth. But you compared this England side to that of 2007 and 2015 before the World Cup in terms of coming in potentially a little bit under fire, um, and it could go one of two ways. And it obviously it was a pretty successful World Cup. But how do you compare the rebuild? to that of post-2007, which maybe wasn't quite so successful, and 2015, which was obviously very successful. 15, unsuccessful. Or no, the rebuild. The rebuild afterwards, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think... Yeah, we, we, we came third, didn't we, in the, in, in the World Cup, which, you know, is... We say remarkable because... We we have the 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 brutal the brutal honesty around that tournament was that if England had not got to a semi final it would have been a monumental balls up. And, you know, we we can't get away from that fact that they were never going to fall at the hurdle of being in the group of not being getting out of the group. I mean, just there was not a chance they were going to lose. It doesn't matter how bad. But just because they lost against Fiji, it didn't matter how bad they were going to be, they were always going to get out of the group um, to either play, you know, Wales or Fiji. Uh, and given given the quality which we're seeing now, which is really the main point I will make, given the quality that England have, it would have been, I think, it would have been a proper disaster if they hadn't got into that semi final. Um, England England played and have been playing the most tedious style of rugby over the last I don't know five, six years maybe um, to a point where people were not falling out of love with the game, but just would be a little bit, well, is this what we're going to go and watch? Is this, look at everybody else, what's everybody else doing? It was just so dull. Um, and I, I, I do genuinely, I, I do genuinely think that Jamie George has been the catalyst in all of this. Mm. Um, and I know that has to then connect with the fact that Owen Farrell isn't in the squad and, and has moved on. Um, but I do, I, I really do think that Jamie George has been instrumental because there's not a chance, not a chance that Steve Borthwick has all of a sudden said, oh, right, OK, we're going to change what we've been doing for the last year and a bit. Um, and this is how we're going to play because that's not Steve Borthwick. You all know Steve Borthwick. All right. We all know what he's like. We all know what he's good at and has been good at for his whole entire life. He's not all of a sudden going to turn around and suggest that England play like they have in this in the latter parts of this Six Nations. Um, and and if, if I was putting my player hat on, um, I think just some of those senior players led by Jamie have probably had a little moment and thought, I, I can't go through the next cycle playing like this. I don't want to. I don't, I, I'm not, you know, I've got 70, 80, 100 caps. I'm, I'm just not, I'm going to look back on my career and have a number of caps. I'm s so what? What, a, a load of caps where you lose or you don't pick up trophies? I mean, who cares? That's just such a selfish viewpoint opposed to, I think someone like Jamie gets it that you could have 20 caps, you could have 40, 50 caps. If you've got a World Cup trophy, you can do what the hell you want for the rest of your life. Uh, yeah, as 31 of us have proven from 2003, you know, there are 
I, I don't know who had the most caps out of that group, probably Jason, obviously, but you know, lots of people on 40, 50, 60 caps in that group. Um, and yet there's this race to get loads of test matches under your belt, but no one's really going to care. No, I mean, genuinely, in, in another 20 years, no one cares how many caps you've got. They really don't. But they do care that you're the world's best team. And I think Jamie's, I think something's triggered in Jamie to say, this is not going to happen in the way that we're playing. We have been playing. Let's look at the talent that we've always had and let's use it. And, um, yeah, I, I just, I just don't think that, um, I just don't think that Steve would have any answer to four or five of his top players saying, you know, some things have got to change. Mm. Um, no, that's interesting. That's interesting. And how important, how important, Matt? And I, I'm thinking of, of Northampton as much as England now. I mean, Northampton are playing, a, I mean, a wildly entertaining stroke exhilarating brand of rugby I mean if you were local to Franklin's Gardens why wouldn't you go and want to watch the stuff they're playing how much does that go back to um, how much does that go back to Chris Boyd and if it does go back to Boyd mm. what did what did he what did he do to uh, to to accelerate this embrace of an all court attacking game that Northampton are bringing to the field now yeah I, I'm sure it has Chris uh, gone back, gone, gone back to Boydie. He, I, I, I think he he brought a um, that sort of Wayne Smith feel to the club, uh, and that's to the fans and to the club of yeah, you because know, Northampton's always been that type of place where they've had all the facilities and all the money and all the sponsors and the best pitches and yada, yada, yada. It's been comfortable. And it was always a battle. Even, you know, when I, when I was there, it was always a battle because it was too comfortable. And, and I think people like Wayne Smith, people like Chris Boyd have a, have a talent for making it comfortably uncomfortable. Hmm. Uh, and the environment that they started to create, um, was a, you know, they were. You could see that they were really grasping hold of the responsibility and being accountable for the town and the people and the club. Um, they were lacking a little bit up front, weren't they? They were lacking that little bit of firepower, but they had a confidence and a, a an ethos that was, you know, sort of maybe the envy of a lot of clubs actually in the mm -hmm. way they're playing. And I, when I watch Northampton, I don't very rarely do I do I feel it's risky. Most of the time, I feel it's the it's really good decision making, and yeah. uh, and uh, and top level sport it doesn't matter whether it's snooker, rugby, Formula One. It really doesn't matter. The top teams or the top players make it look really very simple, very effective very fluid. It doesn't look rushed. It doesn't look like you're taking risks or there's those 50, 50 balls. It, it look, everyone looks in sync. Um, and now Northampton have got a bit of ballast everywhere amongst mm. the squad, you know, whether they've got enough to go up against you, Toulouse or, or Bordeaux. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will, we'll find out in the next few weeks, but um or indeed the the balls at the week at the weekend, um, but there there I think it 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 does it it stems from that foundation that Chris Boyd and that coaching side with I mean Vesti was involved in that as well wasn't he but um, was that was uh, was Dow's there when Boydie was there? He was an assistant, wasn't he, for a good while? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, when you a, watch Saints, you see a team. Down. The passing is just perfectly honed now, isn't it? There's a massive difference between Northampton and even other Premiership sides in their in their ease on the ball. If I can't remember a Saints guy dropping a ball, and and also they make difficult passes look easy, like you were saying, Dawes, 
everything looks absolutely drilled in. And when you when that's your basis, when you start from there, you can start doing really good things when you've got the athletes they've got as well. Yeah, the gas yeah got. And I, I, I think that's part of the that, that that's that's part of that sort of accountability piece. Um that Northampton the the the, the coaches have um ingrained into the players that yeah it might well be a really simple pass it it may be a really simple move but it's got to be executed well yeah um, love it yeah, that, that, that try that they scored at the weekend against Munster when when Freeman went through everybody knows that Northampton do that move Everybody and if everyone tries to do that move, but everyone knows that those Northampton personnel do that move. Uh, you know, there's no surprises there, and yet it's executed at pace so accurate that the defenders just simply cannot mark it, and that's very very difficult to do because you've got to have the timing, the accuracy, you know, the buy-in. The commitment to it all, and uh, they're they're doing it time after time after time. What what is it, Matt, with with Northampton and Scrum Isles? I mean, it's a hell of a tradition now. I mean, there was you, then there was Dicky Jeeps. Sorry, no, there was Dicky Jeeps, then there was you. <laughs> um, uh, but but I mean, you had Lee Dixon. I know Cobus Reinach came from elsewhere. Mitchell is you know pretty much undisputed number one at the moment in the England sense. You've got a kid like McParnan coming through who looks as though he's got all the Dawson-esque qualities of annoying the hell out of opponents um, just with just just with a glance or a couple of well-chosen words. Um, it's a fantastic tradition, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? They're, they are. They've got a little sort of little factory run, haven't they, of, oh. uh, over the years of of, of players being. I, I, I mean, the Mitch is is very. I think he's very different to the list that you've gone through there. Um, he's an outlier a bit, isn't he? In style, yeah, yeah. I, I think he just, I think he has a bit of everything. You know, someone like Copus, I mean, just blistering and proper show stopping moments. But, you know, you, I wouldn't have him down as running the game in the last, as proved in the World Cup final, you know, running the game under all of that pressure. He didn't necessarily have the game management and understanding. I don't think Lee Dixon did either. You know, skills and intricacies and communication for someone like Dicko, brilliant. Um, but Mitch just has this... I think he just has a real instinct for the game that um, it is at a slightly different level than any other scrum half in certainly in England at the moment, and probably should have been should have been playing for England maybe a year or two earlier as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, but Eddie didn't really see it, which is you know unfortunately. The and indeed, Steve thinking. Borthwick didn't see it until last summer because he wasn't in the no. World Cup squad, was he initially? No. Well, you, you know as well as I, Brendan, that you know Eddie and Steve would have been communicating a lot previous yeah. and known each other, and they're going to say the same things about the same players: Ben Earl, Alex Mitchell. Yeah. Um, you know, and fair play, Steve has you know has changed the tune, and that's that's a great skill to have and not be stubborn about it. Um, but Mitch is, if it's it's a bit easy, it's too easy to say that he's a threat because you could say Danny Care is a threat, but Mitch, um, Mitch is a is a as far, from def a defensive point of view, he is a th he makes his team a threat. Mm -hmm. Now he might be part of that himself. You know, it might be running around the corner and dropping someone in, or it might be a tactical kick or speed of pass or what, you know, where his decision-making around the breakdown is always very threatening. So of course, you, you know, the back row have got to stay down. Uh, the fly half can't drift away too much. It, it sort of all starts instinctively with, if you're in defense, like, 
what's Mitch doing? Oh, okay, he's past it, and you're gone. Mm. Whereas most other scrum halves that England have had, it's been, yeah, yeah, it's going to go to 10, it's going to 10, it's going to 10, oh, it's going to a runner, it's going to a runner. And if you lose, it's a little bit like Pete Stringer. Mm. Really nice player, but you just knew, you pretty much knew it was relatively easy to read. And I think Ben Youngs has probably, unfortunately, turned into that type of player. Danny cared, uh, so, you know, have their moments, but really you sort of know what they're about. What, what's interesting Where, is also having a bloke like Tom James there as well, because, you know, I mean, he's a, a, a great foil for, for Mitchell in many ways, isn't he? You know, I mean, a, 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 a bigger man and a more more physical man, but very, very quick as well. Yeah. Yeah, and and it, and it makes it makes playing against Northampton very difficult. Because I, I, but I think that they've got a very difficult game coming up because I, I you know, I looked at the game. I, I actually had a look at it this morning, and you know, before Hendy, um, those two Hendy tries in the second half. I mean, the second one of which he didn't have any right to score at all. I mean, it was brilliant. Um, he he beat you know he beat um Crowley and uh, Zebo Zebo yeah, yeah Zebo as well um to score that but I I think that the Bulls with Jake White as coach and the size of their win I know it was at home on the you know at altitude in Pretoria but you know almost putting sixty points past Leon. And they are a very dangerous side, I think. And they proved as well in the URC, they've gone away and won um, in big games. Uh, so I, I think that that's going to be, uh, you know, I mean, I think everybody is riding the crest of a wave after that <clears throat> that win over Munster. But I think that they, they're going to have a difficult game. Yeah, yeah. I, I I can't dispute that the Bulls are a good side. There's, there's no question about that. I, I'm, yeah, it's that's. It, I, and I know the Bulls have won at the URC. I'm not sure. I'm not sure they've beaten a team like Northampton. Uh, uh, you know, on their on their home patch. No, uh, but I, I sort of think Northampton are going to have to play even better than they did yeah. against against Munster. And Le Leon were not good though, were they? No. They, were. They, they they left a few at home as well, in fairness. And yeah, it's a long but, way to go for a game of rugby. I mean, I know the Bulls are doing that in, in reverse, but yeah. it's... Uh, uh, and that's tough, Chris. Uh, yeah. Uh, let, let's, you know I, know, I know you boys could easily travel down to South Africa and be prepped up for the next day, but it's slightly, it's slightly <laughs> different when you want to run around for 80 minutes. And, Indeed. Don't, you know, don't uh, underestimate what we do, Matt. You don't underestimate what we do. I mean, I mean, we're, we're under real pressure. I'm talking of underestimation as a as a a, a, a scrum half of of your class, Matt. Um, are the things said about Dupont over the top, or is he as good as commonly described? I someone said to me uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and admittedly, he was my age. But he said, if if Dupont was playing in my era, would he be would would he be ahead of everyone? And if so, how far ahead would he be of Rob Howley, George Gregan, um, Yurt, yeah. yeah. Justin Marshall, um. Because I, and and I think that's a really fair question because I think Dupont plays he plays a style of rugby that probably probably was more frequently played fifteen twenty years ago. Um, I think the difference is with Dupont though is that not only has he got that vision and endeavour to do all of you know to to hit the short sides, link, um, etc. But he's got the pace, he's got the power, he's got that. You know, Austin was a bit like that. Oh, it's so strong and so fast and so skillful, 
but Austin, you know, w- wouldn't necessarily have had the management skills uh, uh, in a, in a big game to get the team through, whereas Dupont does, mm-hmm. or you know, Yust would would have had the individual brilliance to make the try saving tackles or you know make the break and finish off one on one with a fullback but wouldn't necessarily have the finesse to bring in the you know the the big players around him and and again manage the big games in attack whereas dupont does you know du- I, I, i'm struggling uh, i'm struggling for anyone to ever say to me yeah but Oh look, he's just been found out in this area of the game. I just don't see it. I really don't see it. Yeah. Matt, so, he's played two hundred and fifty senior games or something. Started two hundred and fifty senior games, and I think last year he he got to a point where he played the same number of minutes as Johnny Sexton had played, and Sexton was twelve years older than him. And he's packed a lot of rugby in, and like you say, he's never had a bad game. I've never seen him have a bad game. He's oh. always eight out of ten. More often than not, he's nine out of ten. And fairly frequently, he's a 9.5 and a 10. And I don't think anybody has matched that consistency. Ever. No, 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 I, I, I absolutely agree. It's, um, I, I, I think it's, I, I, I think it's a mixture of the, the slight old school mentality that he has of, um, manipulating the opposition being one step ahead of where they're defending what the referee is up to you know again that sort of snooker mentality of it's not about potting this red it's where's the fifth red down the line Mm -hmm. that's the one that's my difficult one so he's and a vast majority of scrum halves in the modern day are it's all about the here and now it's about the ruck in front of you Whereas not only do do I feel DuPont has this sort of vision of the game, but he has the physicality to be able to do it. And, you know, so his training methods, his fitness, his his ability to repeat it um, week after week when the opposition are looking out for you and to create gaps uh, and to make big tackles to read the game well to kick goals to all of a sudden then be moved into tech you know he knows the game inside out he's like the it's it's like he's uh keanu reeves in the matrix you know what i mean where everything's just happening so slow slowly around him that he's like yeah now i've got it i've got everything under control here there's also the French dimension, isn't there? We, 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 uh, the thing that separates a lot of French scrum halves stylistically from how the game is played elsewhere in the world. I mean, we go back to Fru and Bebizier and Galleon. I mean, they've there, there is there is so much of of French rugby is on the shoulders of the nine in terms of immediate mm. game management. Um, you know, they don't have as many famous tens in history as a lot of other nations. They're, 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 they're great halfbacks. The most celebrated halfbacks tend to be nines. That's true. And, they, and they've struggled, haven't they? Let's face it. it, it even, you know, even your sort of para and Yashvili that would be swapping over and yeah. changing positions. You're great, really, really good players. Yeah. yeah. But no, 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 no one's really getting close. No one's getting close to. I was going to say where he could go, but he's already there. I mean, it is. I don't know how many years he's been playing, but it, it's. Um, it it feels like he's only been on the circuit three years. It's like oh, he's one of these new players that can do everything. Oh yeah, keep an eye on him. It will be. <laughs> but you know, he's been doing it for five, six years. I guess. I mean, it's just well. Oh, More than that, he's been playing yeah. for Castor as a seventeen-year-old, so he's probably been doing it. Ma- yeah. Ma- Maro Bergamasco could have made it if he'd stuck at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt, I know. Well, how are you doing for time, Matt? Have you got five more minutes, or do you need to get right? Yeah, yeah, we're we're all fine. 
All right, oh, fantastic. Well, what, one other player I wanted to ask you about was Finn Smith, um, who is obviously increasingly staking his claim for that England number 10 show. He's already outplayed Jack Crowley once earlier this year, and he did the same, arguably, at the weekend. Um, he's done the same with Owen Farrell um, a couple of weeks ago as well. What do you make of the sort of the Smith versus Smith vie for the number 10 shirt that's almost mm -hmm. inevitable once Ford has, has hung up his boots? Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a good tussle and one that um you know, one that hopefully will will last a few years. Um I I I think the I think the 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 one key difference for me, uh, which will be in Finn's favour, um, and they are very different as fly halves. Um, but the one key difference is I, th I think if England want to win a world cup, then they have to play Finn Smith. And for no other reason, uh, and there is a lot of knowledge on this call, um, but you would struggle to name me a, Maverick fly half who has won the World Cup. Yeah, and when I say Maverick, I mean, you know, a Finn Smith type, oh my God, look, he's he's doing it all himself type player. Mm. You would struggle oh. to name me one. Uh, that, yeah. I mean, that's... Carter could have Maverick moments, but he was also incredibly consistent and solid and all that. Well, he was brilliant, wasn't he? He was just brilliant. But he, he could be a, you know, he scored 29 tries. He was a, a miracle worker as well as a game controller, but he could do the game controlling brilliantly when he had to, couldn't he? He did so Butch James. Possibly. <laughs> that, that, but but that is that's possibly the one. That's the maybe he's the outlier in uh, and the reason why I say that, and to your to answer your your uh challenge and your fair challenge there, Brendan, is um, 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 and rather than Maverick, name me a fly half who's won the World Cup where their heart rate has never gone other than the plateau of calmness whether they're doing something brilliant or they or they're in or if they're in the shit yeah. where the fluctuation of heart rate is minimal and that is my real it's a and it sounds ridiculous and it's not really sort of sort of quantifiable is it but that is it's the ice in the veins matt isn't it it's the ice in the veins. And it, it worries me. It really worries me about Marcus because he's phenomenal. I mean, yeah. just does some unbelievable stuff. And, you know, I, I'm not saying he's, you know, he's a maverick like Carlos Spencer or, you know, someone like that or, or Danny Cipriani. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But there are moments, too many moments in games where... Marcus's like adrenaline and um, heart rate goes absolutely through the roof. Whether it's you know he scores a try or the team scores a try or there's a big moment and he's like whooping and hollering and blah blah blah. Yeah. blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You're the general. What's next? Yeah. What's happening next with the team? Score the try, kick the conversion, move. Or, you know what I mean? It's that. I think that's yeah. a very good point, Matt. I think that's a, a really sound point. Yeah, he, he does get overexcitable at times, doesn't he? And does that yeah. sometimes that fuels him and he can do great things. But when you get to semi finals and finals of World Cups, it might have the uh, detrimental effect. I mean, it, it just, yeah. And, and to go back to your original question, Ollie, the, I, I see more of that with Finn. Yeah. I, I, I see, I see that analytical um sort of strategic fly half mm. and still has the the capabilities to to go through the processes and deliver it but it's all very much in the delivery yeah. uh, and it could be him individually or it could be the back line but it seems to be he, he seems to have that sort of flow of of the game and then to be able to repeat and repeat, and we're you know I, 
the 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 stuff in um at Tom and Park in that awful weather down to fourteen men or whatever it was, you know, just they're the moments that yeah. I think ooh, you know you can do that there. You can, and I know. Don't get me wrong. I know Marcus Smith has been fly off when Quinns have had some big away games. All right, and I know that he has the capabilities, and that's why I think it's going to be a fantastic battle. But if you're asking me for a difference, that's potentially that that's quite a significant one for me. A yeah. really interesting point, Matt. Um, and uh, uh, overall, I, I I see exactly um, where you're coming from with it. The only thing that intrigues me is the ability of players to grow. Some players don't seem to me to grow during their careers. And, you know, they, they're, they're a shooting star and it lasts for a while and then they, they can't maintain it or they fall off for one reason or another, injuries, et cetera, et cetera. Marcus Smith is, um, is a player who the question mark is, is whether he has the capacity to manage the game with that cool head that you're, that you're talking about. And that will require a change from him. There's no question. I can see that there's a bit more of that coming into his game. I don't know whether it, I, I don't know how old he is. I think he's, is he in his mid twenties now? I think. I would say uh, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether at that stage it's possible to keep on growing and to build that more um, or whether he's sort of, you know, his natural instincts are sort of so fixed that he won't be able to do that. Uh, uh, well, I mean, we've got, we've got to look at the coaching. We have to look at the coaches that are around him. Um and I, I I personally think it's doable, right? and and reason why I Especially say that Nick Evans, Nick Evans would be able would would mm. is, is I assume is just the bloke to yeah. maximise Marcus's knowledge and his application of that knowledge because Evans was you know of whatever he lacked as a ten, it wasn't rugby brain and instinct. No, no, I mean, I, I, yeah, I I, I think. I mean, we don't know, don't we? Don't we? Don't. I'd be fascinated to know what sort of the work, if they do do work on that part of his game, um, because it, it. I think it would be really easy to see because he scores lots of tries, and and it's, it's a really simple one for me. Is that you, you could, as a coach, you could easily say to to Marcus Smith, right, the next time you score a try. I, I don't want you, you know, fist That's pump perfect. into the crowd and, you know, getting hugged by all your mates or the rest of it. I want you to score the try, get back, kick the conversion and and regroup and see if you have the mental... You know what I mean? You, we would all be able to see that because it would be very obvious because now when you see Marcus score, score, that's what he does. That's his celebration. And the reason why I, I'm convinced it is very coachable... I remember Sean Edwards uh, talking to Owen Reddin. You remember the scrum halves at Wasps and Ireland? Yeah. And he was, uh, as I was in my, like, well, probably both my years at Wasps, he, uh, he was my understudy for about half the year. And then it was like, no, no, this kid needs to come through here. And it, it, he, was, he was absolutely on fire, real live wire head all over the place but real live where loads of energy read the game really well but would be properly intense and would put, and sometimes would get a bit scatty and Sean Edwards recognized it and and then told him right um before the game and at half time you are not allowed to uh talk to the team um, I, I only want you to go and warm up for a limited period of time. And then, as I say, at half time, you are going to sit in the change room and you're going to read a book. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, what? I said, that's what you're going to do. And he did. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he did that for the rest of his career. But I remember, and I remember going in and, you know, before the game, there he is just you know, reading some random book 
half time would go in read his book and everyone's you know all right do this do that what about this well we've got to change this and but no he was like and then he would come in for the last couple of minutes or you know, before the game he would write he'd calm himself down and go out for 20 minutes and all that so all of that stuff can be done um it just depends on whether the coaches pick on the right um the right sort of methods to be able just to make them realize where the benefits are you, and by the end of his career he was go on sorry Brent. he was absolutely model pro steady eddie wasn't he by the end of his career with a stack of island caps and he yeah. was the mr dependable none of the scattiness at all it really no. did transform him your, your argument's born out really, Matt, by what happened at last year's World Cup. I mean, the Springboks, um, for injury reasons as much as anything. But we all saw Pollard coming, didn't we? We all we all knew that at the very back end, when it really mattered, um, your Vilemsas or your Libox, um, when it came to who's going to get us through the biggest 80 minutes we're going to play, yeah, and they they turned to the 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 least theatrical, let's say, for want of a better word, of all the candidates to play 10. Well, you can't, you can't, you know, guys, you've been, um, goodness knows how many years you, you lot have been involved in rugby. You can't tell me, you can't tell me at the very highest level, too much has changed, really. I mean, I know they're, they're stronger and they're fitter, uh, and they're faster, but how you know how they train, how they prepare, the mental side of the game, how, what wins games, what loses games. If you were to list them from, th never mind twenty years ago when I played, it probably was the same in the nineteen nineties. Really, the fundamentals of how you win those big games are exactly the same. It's what, what you it's what you call the abstractions of rugby, isn't it? The indefinables, they're not the things that shift. The measurables shift in terms of pace and power and dynamism and everything a GPS will tell you. But a GPS yeah. can't tell you anything about the abstractions of the game. No. No, no, it can't. It can't tell it can't tell you how uh you know how what how momentum is. Uh, uh, you, know, you could be going back on all the stats you know on the retreat but you have momentum in the game because you've got the referee in the pocket or you can see you can hear what the opposition are saying and what they're talking about and the panic you can feel from the opposition or what they're worried about or what little moves have worked for you that none of us can see from the touchline or the hit in the scrum and who's struggling or you just can't see all of that at the highest of all levels you just can't it, it, it's so uh yeah abstract as you say yeah if you if you had a gps that could detect that stuff matt austin healy would never have got on the field for you he'd have had to go on for neil jenkins because it would have had like an inbuilt bullshit detector wouldn't it if if one of us had that there is Fuck all chance that we'd be on this podcast right now, I'll tell you that. We'd be, we'd be in our estate somewhere with with Rodders down in West Sussex. That's where we'd be. <laughs> Is that all of West Sussex? <laughs> um, guys, I, I, I think we should probably look towards wrapping up i just had one more thing on the menu today obviously we've got four champions cup fixtures this weekend we've got bordeaux harlequins leinster la rochelle northampton balls and toulouse exeter could i just get everyone's winners please starting with you matt right let's have a look here i've got them. um uh but yeah bordeaux as much as harlequins can um yeah, they won in Racing, didn't they, in the group stages? Um, but Bordeaux, very different proposition. Um, I don't think they'll have enough over 80 minutes, Quinn. So I think Bordeaux will win that. <sighs> Leinster, La Rochelle, blimey. So much victory behind that. I just think it's probably going to go to a home win for, for Leinster. Um, La Rochelle travelled away, didn't they, last weekend? Yeah, yeah, they're flying back yeah. from South Africa, aren't they? Yeah. 
Oh, that's that's a tough couple of weeks. So uh, yeah, maybe just Leinster, Northampton. I I actually think Northampton will be relatively comfortable. I don't mean a massive score, but I I think they're I think they're in good shape, good shape to win that. Uh, and then I'm going for a fourth home win in Toulouse. Yeah. Um, I'd be very interested to hear if anyone else has got an away win. Maybe La Rochelle, but. I don't. I've got four home wins. I don't know about you guys, but yeah, I think home wins. Yeah, same here with, with La Rochelle as the question mark, because they have got another dimension. Once that pack gets lumbering, they can make life very difficult. And and they've got a tradition of coming back against Leinster, but I think Leinster are so up for this one. I think yeah. this, is their, this is payback time, I think. Yeah. I'm guessing the side. No, I I I'd oh, love God. to I I love disagreeing with people as you know, but I I I mean look, Leinster La Rochelle is the is the tightest one. I do think the Bulls are dangerous actually. I mean that's a hell of a back division if they're all playing. I mean mm. crikey, I mean there's a a lot of gas there, and that could be a, that could be a wildly entertaining game. But I do take Northampton at their level of confidence in the kind of arena that the Bulls don't often play in because those <laughs> stadiums in South Africa are just gigantic, aren't they? I mean, I mean, Loftus, I mean, they might have had a decent crowd there at the weekend for all I know, but you couldn't see any of them. I mean, because it's just such a huge stadium. Franklin's Gardens, which is one of my, my favourite grounds in the country, would just be, a, that'll be a cracking atmosphere there. And it'll be, it'll be very, very intense atmospherically and it'll be, It'll, it'll be a Northampton win, I think. So, yeah, I go for four home wins. That was a long-winded way of saying four home wins. <laughs> it really was. Um, I'm not sure the podcast was better for it, to be honest, but hey, how are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brendan, have you got four home wins as well? Uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Okay. Oh, That's sorry. a very short way yeah, of saying that. K K K Kano. Yeah, uh, Kano, you've got four wins, four home wins. I, I, I think that that Northampton Bulls game is going to be uh, a closer affair than Matt does, but um, I do think that Northampton, you've got to you've you you've got to back up considering the way that they've been playing. But Jake White's a canny bugger. I want to see Ronan O'Gara coaching with ice in his veins instead of in a huge frenzy of fire and having <laughs> arguments right, left, and centre. I mean, it's a good place to have an argument, Matt, isn't it? Franklin's Gardens up there in the coaches' boxes. Uh, why? Why is Ryan O'Gara going to be having a have a spot? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> what? What? He barely. I'm oh, so sorry, sorry, Frank. Of course. Yeah, that bit. I... <laughs> no, that bit staying in. True. Well done. It's like uh, it's one o'clock. Is it drinky time? <laughs> drinky time <laughs> it was before the podcast started for Chewy. <laughs> um, yeah. So we've all got. Well, that's sixteen predictions for home wins, and if it is four home wins, that will mean eleven out of twelve home wins. So, for, um, in the past two weekends, so that maybe reopens a door for a Champions Cup format discussion for later down the line. Um, where, where about, whereabouts are the semi-finals? Do we? Do someone educate me with that? I think that. Um, don't Northampton stay at, stay at home? I can have a look. Hang on. Let's are a bang to say at home because they always do. They always do. It's written into the contract. Yeah, they play every yeah. match at home. Oh, it also on the um Champions Cup website, it all says TBC. Um right. I think I heard that Milton Keynes is being lined up for the semi if Northampton win. Let's forget a nosebleed if they leave Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> That one also. Well, maybe maybe, maybe Ronan will be coaching Leinster by then, anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Along with the Bulls. It'll, it'll be a very, it'll be very different to Leo Cullen, won't it? <laughs> oh, guys, I think let's wrap up there. We've got our predictions. We've gone off piece, but we've covered pretty much all I set out to cover. Um, Matt, great having you. And are you playing golf this weekend? Yes, it is the Masters Medal this weekend okay. where um yeah there's a medal on saturday morning and before you tee off you will draw out someone in who's made the cut and your score is aggregated with their score oh my god <laughs> so you could you could end up shooting your lights out and then get some proper dodgy player <laughs> shooting 82 and lose so uh yeah good fun that's really what? good 
What Ooh. handicap do you play off, Matt? Uh, I'm off six. All right. Who's your pick to win the Masters? Um, I feel... I mean, Chef is going to be hard to beat. Um, um, what's his name? Um, oh, goodness me. Uh, Wackin. Neiman. Neiman. Wackin Neiman's on good form. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Hideki's also. Is it? No, Mats yeah, Matsuyama. Matsuyama, yeah. Yeah. Any yeah. chance of Rory um, sneaking in on the blind side now everybody's written off his chances? I mean, you'd, I, I would love it. Uh, I'd love it to, for him to complete it, but you just, you, I mean, all right, maybe he's under the radar now. Could you even begin to imagine that he's near the top of the leaderboard yeah. it's on Sunday? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go absolutely off. Yeah. And mm. uh, yeah, where, well, let's see whether he's Marcus Smith or Finn, or Finn Smith. Oh, good rap, good rap. Ooh. Well, you've done this before, Matt. <laughs> Matt, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and yeah, enjoy that. Mar what do you call it? Masters medal this weekend. I hope you get Bryson. I think Bryson's going to win it. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, a, it's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me on, Ollie. Lovely to see you, uh, you fine gentlemen. I'm sure that we will see each other on the circuit at some stage. And yeah, you, good Matt, good and good thanks good for good making good. it from Barbados, Ollie. Well done. Yeah, well um, done. <laughs> jo joining us and interrupting your golf holiday. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe to our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day. <laughs>